Hello, friends. Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to our latest video. Today, we're going to take a look at the fabled Devil's Highway, America's Route 666. Join us. 1929, the American highway system was naming routes for the American people, and travel was getting well underway. Roads were connecting the winding Blue Ridge Parkway and backcountry rural routes to the east to the western flat clay sandy deserts and the steep mountainous passes of the Rockies. The world-famous Route 66 would take drivers through some beautiful countryside, coast to coast. There would also be a system put in place for highways to connect Mexico to Canada. All these roads were starting to become more popular, and automobile transportation was quickly becoming a preferred way to travel. Construction got underway to build the first superhighway in the United States. The rumor of how the major American interstates and highway systems were built goes something like this. Seeing a need to connect states for travel, President Roosevelt grabbed a map and drew three lines, north and south, and three lines east and west. He then asked the Bureau of Public Roads to build them. The Federal Highway Act of 1938 was established and the investigations into the cost, efficiency, and demand of superhighway systems was well underway. These superhighways would later become known as interstates and essential for traveling around the country. Pennsylvania Turnpike and I-70 would be the first major interstates in the United States. Now, allow me to take you all back to November 26, 1926, when Route 66 was started. This came to be known as America's Mother Road the main street of the United States, if you will. This would be the most major route of travel from Chicago to Los Angeles. Each offshoot of roadways from Route 66 had a number designated to it. In 1929, the sixth offshoot to Route 66 was completed. The highway department named each of these routes by the number they were built. And thus, Route 6 of Route 66 was named Route 666. At 200 miles long, this particular stretch of roadway connects four states, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. Much of those 200 miles, 89 of them to be exact, winds through the sweeping desert of the Navajo Reservation. For years, the Navajo people asked the New Mexico Highway Department to change the name of the Devil's Highway. The Navajo people, for the most part, are very religious, and the name of the highway was disrespectful to them, and they wanted it gone. There's also a problem with people stealing the Route 666 signs. In 2003, the number of the route was changed officially to 491, and many people were happy to see the Devil's Highway make its exit. The Devil is gone, happily shouted an onlooker of the dedication ceremony. Now, here in 2022, we'll look at the sordid history and tales of the infamous Route 666. The name may have changed, but the stories, myths, Curses and ghosts remain. Years before 666 was a highway or even thought to be a road, it was a footpath that connected Mexico to and from the United States. The name it had then was the Old Spanish Trail, carved over centuries through the rugged desert by each footstep of ancestors long ago making the trek from Mexico to the United States. They used the route for trading and to come into America, seeking a better life. In the middle of the 19th century, there was a war between Mexico and the United States that established new borders, and the route wasn't used as much. The old route meandered through rugged canyons, steep mountain passes, and even crossed raging rivers. Many lives were lost along this route long before it became the Devil's Highway. But when Route 666 was given its infamous name, it's as though it was waiting for the opportunity to live up to that infamous moniker. Sandy, our staff writer and researcher for the channel, has an encounter that she'd like to share that happened on Route 666. Sandy writes, My encounter with 666 happened when it was already the new 491. I work in Colorado, but live in New Mexico. This means I drive a stretch of that road from Shiprock, New Mexico, to Cortez, Colorado frequently. I'm a traveling nurse, and sometimes if it's too late when I get done visiting my patient, I'll stay the night and make the drive home the next morning, as I try to avoid making that drive at night. This particular night, however, I had an early morning meeting that I had to be home for and needed to get back. 
By the time I got out of the door of my patient's house, it was already dusk. Winter had a good grip on the area, and the trees shivered in the wind. The last of the leaves waving at me in the distance from the big American elm in his yard as I walked to my car. It was your average late October night, mostly cloudy, full moon, and the wind was blowing up a storm, literally. I made my way inside my car and started her up. The roar of my V8 engine came to life, and I put it in first, pulling out of his driveway. I could feel the wind pushing my car as if trying to hurry me along. I'd lost track of time, and it was fast approaching full darkness, which made an already desolate road even more bleak. I'd heard so many horror stories about former Route 666, and this was one of the many reasons I disliked driving that stretch even in the daylight. My mind turned to the tales I'd heard of skinwalkers, Bigfoot, UFOs, a ghostly monster of a big rigged truck that had flames coming out of smokestacks that would run cars off the road, demon dogs that can shred tires with their claws and teeth, and even the devil himself. I had a sudden feeling of fear. I never really felt this uncomfortable on this road. Sure, I thought about those stories I'd heard and sometimes wondered, what if? About this time, I started to wish I'd stayed at my patient's house. He owns a local hotel, and I could have gotten a room like I'd done so many times before. But my early morning meeting and obligations pushed me on, and soon I was well on my way. Zipping down the road, singing along to Godsmack and sipping what was left of my sweet iced tea. Still, the thoughts of those stories made me shiver. I pushed on the accelerator, my car lurched forward. As I checked my rearview mirror, as I often do, I could see headlights off in the distance coming up on me, but far enough back that I would probably be in shiprock before they caught up to me. I just rolled over the state line when I glanced one more time at my mirror and saw that the approaching car was closing the gap between us at a quick rate. Thinking nothing of it because everyone speeds on that road. It is really flat and there's almost no homes or towns in between Cortez and shiprock. Just Toak, which is literally a casino, a gas station, and a few homes. I was well past that area, though, and now approaching Shiprock. I kept telling myself that, even as that car was literally right on my bumper now. I slowed down and expected them to pass me. Center line was dotted for passing, and I fully expected to see them zoom around me at any moment. Another few miles, though, and they're still keeping pace. Glancing at my speedometer and see that I'm already approaching 100 miles an hour. Now, there is speeding, and there's reckless driving, and this was definitely reckless. I slowed, careful not to slam on my brakes. I didn't want an accident out in the middle of nowhere. The car slowed with me, but was still so close I could no longer see their headlights. I picked up my phone and started to dial 911. The service is spotty in this area, and regular emergency calls sometimes just won't go through. Then, just as I dialed, the car came speeding around and pulled up alongside me, and kept pace there for about a half mile, revving the engine and swerving towards me. Great, I thought, a drunk driver. If you've ever driven even a small stretch of this road, you'll see white crosses along the highway that mark where someone has died. A lot of those accidents involved alcohol. I glanced over to the car to wave them on, but could see no one driving. In fact, I could see nothing because the windows were so darkly tinted. This time, I did slam my brakes on. I just wanted the car to go around me and get out of the way of oncoming traffic. The dark-colored sedan pulled in front of me and slowed down under the speed limit. I was getting really annoyed at this point, so I selected the Sport Plus mode on my Mustang. It gives the car more power to accelerate quicker. Put on my turn signal and went around him. As I passed him, I could see the driver's eyes this time because they cracked the window, and what I saw scared the hell out of me. Those eyes were red, a glowing, sinister, evil red. I was so scared that I almost didn't see the truck coming at me in the oncoming traffic lane. I quickly regained my composure and got in front of the now speeding dark car. We were just outside of Shiprock, and as I topped the hill and turned a corner, I lost sight of the car. The speed limit dropped, and I expected to see the car coming up on me again, but it didn't. I never saw it again. There was literally no Horford to have turned off in that area. I don't know where it went. I pulled over on the side of the road and contemplated turning around to see if I could find it, 
but I listened to my instincts that were screaming for me to keep heading home. Rest of the trip, uneventful. I told my husband about the encounter the next day and a neighbor in casual conversation. My neighbor happens to be a member of the Navajo tribe and told me about the story of the devil's sedan. Supposedly, people traveling at night have reported either being ran off the road, forced to pull over, gotten bumped from the rear, or see the car approaching at a high rate of speed just to watch it disappear. Kind of like what I experienced. It's called the Devil's Sedan, and it's out there, somewhere, on former U.S. Route 666, waiting for the next unsuspecting driver. Next, skinwalkers. Now, skinwalkers are a Native American creature, specifically on the Navajo Reservation, although there are stories of it in other tribes. It's said to be a witch that practices black magic, and it can change into an animal, such as a wolf or coyote at will, and has a main objective to take souls of people for themselves to cross more easily from their existence into ours. They will wear the skins of the animals they want to become, hence skinwalker, and shapeshift into them. This story starts as a call to a Navajo ranger to investigate a sighting of a skinwalker that was attacking animals on a ranch close to Window Rock, Arizona. Window Rock is the equivalent of what a state capital would be, but for the Navajo Nation Reservation. Navajo Rangers are law enforcement that are also trained to investigate paranormal reports on the Navajo Reservation. As the ranger made his way out to the call, this is the story he tells. I arrived at the Begay Ranch at 22.30 hours and set up near the first sighting or incident. Apparently by this time there had already been a sighting of the creature. I remained in my vehicle until 0030 hours and at that time conducted a foot patrol of the area and took a voice recorder with me. The following incident occurred. At 0053 hours, I heard what sounded like a whooping sound coming from in between the barn and a mesa on the west side of the property. When I arrived at the area where I thought the sound may have come from, I observed the animals awake and acting fearful. There was nothing visual that would lead me to believe the animal or skinwalker or whatever it was was in the area. Because of the mesa, it's hard to tell if the entity is or was on the property or closer to the mesa, which is about a half a mile away. I walked the perimeter of the barn and watched the area until 0330 hours when I returned to my vehicle. Nothing was observed for the rest of the night. This concluded the first night of the investigation. Night two, I arrived at the Begay Farm at 20.00 hours because tonight we have a team here. Myself, another investigator, ranger, a paranormal team of three, a veterinarian, and the property owners, Mr. and Ms. Begay. The objective tonight is to perform a necropsy on a farm animal that was found in the early morning hours by Mr. Begay during feeding time. The sheep was found in the same area I was investigating last night and heard the whooping sound. We're again on the west end of the property. The visual examination conducted. The following findings were noted and recorded. The specimen was drained of blood and no blood was visible in the area. The incisions were surgical precision and the specimen was dissected completely in half. The wound looked as if it were cauterized during the process. Eyes, teeth, lungs, tongue, stomach, anus, reproductive organs, and heart were all missing. A patch of fur from the back leg was also missing. There was also a small burn the size of a dime on the hoof. Core temperature of the specimen was 115 degrees Fahrenheit. This was the strangest of the findings. Time of examination was 1 hour 17 minutes. The vet was baffled. The core body temperature should have been well below 90 degrees Fahrenheit. How could it be 115? Everyone stood around for a couple of hours talking about what they'd witnessed. It was by far the weirdest thing they'd ever seen. Everyone was readying themselves to leave the area when a rock was thrown and struck the ranger's truck. It took a moment for them to realize what had happened and what had been thrown. The ranger grabbed his flashlight and headed in the direction of where they thought it was thrown from, paranormal investigators in tow. The remaining group decided to head back to the homestead and wait for the other group to return there. The ranger group was well on their way into the forest that surrounded the ranch. There was a small hill, and beyond that it opened into a valley, and they were just getting to the top of the hill when another rock came flying at them. It didn't hit anyone, 
but this rock was larger than the last one. The size alone would suggest that whoever or whatever threw it was quite large. They stopped and were looking at the rock when they noticed the rock was warm, almost hot to the touch. Curiosity pushed them on. The ranger would later say this was the point they should have turned around and headed back to the homestead, but they didn't. In fact, they decided to split up and search for whatever this was. Meanwhile, the homestead group was just arriving back to the house and noticed the screen door was open and the motion sensor light was on. There was no reason the light should be on. There were no animals in the back, and they had arrived from the front. They quickly got inside, feeling a bit jarred by what could have set the light off, when a loud thud hit the front door. Mr. Piguet went to the window and looked out just in time to see a large, bipedal, wolf-like creature slinking around the corner of the house. He was so shocked and scared, he stood there fixated at the window, not able to move. Ms. Begay had to pull him away from the window and was asking what he saw when another thud hit the back door. The group was now terrified. The veterinarian wanted to just leave, but the fear of whatever was outside kept her inside the house. The other group had split up, and one of those groups had been chased into the small valley by a growling, red-eyed beast. They ran, screaming the whole way into the small valley, where the rest of their group met up with them. A light drizzle of rain had started when they had initially split up, it was now turning into a full-on downpour. Between the monster chasing them and the rain, they had to make a quick plan to get back to the ranger's truck. While they were trying to figure out how to get back, another rock was thrown, and this time it hit one of the investigators, leaving a small knot on her head. That motivated them to run, going around and away from the way they had come in, this time sticking together. The homestead group were still being assaulted with rocks being thrown at the house, loud bangs on the doors, and growling from the wolf creature Mr. Begay had seen. The rain was coming in sheets, and the wind was howling right along with the wolf that was stalking them. They were huddled together, lights all turned off but one in the hallway where they were. Each bang on the door made them jump, and not knowing if it was the wolf or the others they had left back at the sheep pen, they were too scared to get up and look. About this time, the other group, soaked to the bone and having been chased most of the night, finally made their way back to the ranger's truck, and were able to get in and start making their way to the homestead. They were almost there when a coyote ran out into the road and stood, staring at them, more like glaring at them. It was a big coyote. In fact, it was one of the largest the ranger had ever seen. What worried them most was that a coyote is one of the animals that a skinwalker can shift into. Not knowing what to do, they drove forward, as if to call the thing's bluff, but it just stood there, defiant and glaring. The ranger didn't want to hit it, but he had had enough for this night and was ready to get as far away from this cursed place as possible. They drove on, and when they got to the spot where they should have felt the bump from running over the coyote, there was nothing. It had vanished. They pushed on, grateful to be in the safety of the truck and out of the weather. Now they just needed to make it to the house. Thankfully, they weren't far away. Mr. Begay had grown tired of the wolf that was stalking them and went to retrieve his shotgun. This was going to end, he thought. He shoved a handful of shells into his pocket and grabbed his 12-gauge. At the same time, the rest of the group pulled up outside and saw a dark house. This worried them. They got out and started to make their way towards the porch when one of the investigators saw a flash of fur running at top speed towards them. They were halfway between the porch and the truck. Two ran for the porch and started banging on the door to get in the house, and two made their way back to the truck. The wolf thing chased the two that were running for the truck, and they barely had time to get in and slam the door before it came smashing into the side, making a dent. The ranger and the other investigator were still banging on the door when it swung open, and they were met with a double-barrel shotgun in their face. They both let out a gasp or scream before being pulled inside, and the door slammed behind them. The ranger told Mr. Begay that two people were still outside and that they had to get to them. The ranger and Mr. Begay checked the windows and with no wolf in sight, opened the door and started for the truck, head on a swivel the whole way. They got on the porch and were waving for the others to hurry and come. They were not about to leave the safety of the truck, though. They just saw the wolf thing making its way around the back of the vehicle and it was now shaking it from side to side like the wolf was trying to turn it over. Come on, the ranger was yelling at them. The truck was now violently shaking. Let's go, we have to. 
The doors opened and there were feet on the ground running for the safety of the house with the wolf thing right on their heels. All four made it onto the porch, but the wolf was right on them and bit into the heel of the female investigator. She screamed out in pain and the others grabbed her and for a second played a little game of tug and war with her and the wolf creature that was now standing on its back legs with her foot in its mouth. With a jolt, they all fell into the door as her shoe came off in the wolf's mouth and she was safely inside with the others. The ranger kicked the door closed just as the wolf charged at them. There was a loud crash as this thing slammed into the frame with a yelp. The investigator's foot was breathing profusely and she was crying from the terror and pain. We need to get her to a hospital, but the closest one was an hour away, and there was this beast outside stalking them. The best they could do was wrap it and wait it out. It was now past 4.30 in the morning, and it would be light out soon. They could hear the thing growling, howling, and banging against the house for the next hour, but they had shuttered the windows closed and reinforced the doors to keep themselves safe until they could get away. No one knew why this culminated into attack this particular night, and no one understood what these two beasts were, the strange coyote and the wolf creature. As they spoke about it, the Begays didn't want to spend one more night on the land. The sightings had gotten progressively worse, and now they were being attacked. The Begays were convinced that the land was cursed, and nothing could fix it. They talked about a medicine man possibly doing a blessing, but they just wanted out. This was too much, and they were losing their animals now which was their livelihood. They'd observed orbs and heard howling, screams, and had had seven animals killed by these things. There was no way they were going to stay. The ranger told them about the coyote, and that further drove the idea of moving away. They couldn't sell because reservation land can't be bought. It can only be leased. They would have to find another place for their animals, but they had to protect their livestock and themselves. As dawn approached, the growling had ceased, and they no longer heard the animal or whatever it was pacing outside. They opened the shutters one by one, but there was nothing but a gloomy day and rain hitting the windows. They still had the issue of getting the investigator to a hospital, while the others agreed to take her. She had been sleeping for the last hour and appeared to be having nightmares, but who wouldn't after what she went through? The Begays thanked everyone and apologized profusely for what had transpired. The ranger had to make a report and ask what they wanted to do with that. They told him to be honest. After all, they had all experienced what had happened. The ranger was the first to leave, but only after making sure the Begays were okay, and he did give them some tips to keep them safe, but they assured him they wouldn't be staying one more night there. The ranger even suggested that they had a skinwalker and possibly a Bigfoot on their ranch, and them leaving would probably be for the best. He would go on to write a book about his experience that night, among others he had during his career as a Navajo rancher. The veterinarian was the next to leave. She was intrigued by the examination she had done the night before on the animal and said she wished she had more time to go over the case with the Begays. At this point, though, they weren't even worried about the circumstances that brought them all together. They just wanted out of there. They asked her to keep the file sealed until they moved away, and she agreed. She would move her practice to another state, a few months after the story. The investigators were the last to leave. They tried to let the woman that had been bitten sleep as long as possible before they left. The Begays thanked them and made arrangements to have their animals moved that day and leave themselves. They would never stay another night in the homestead. The investigators took the lady with the bite into the emergency department and she was treated and released with instructions to return for treatment of rabies. She would complete the treatment before going missing three days after her last vaccine. Her friends and team spent months looking for her, but they never saw her again. A year and a half after she was reported missing, her car was allegedly found near the old Begay homestead. There were many articles inside. Her purse, cell phone, a map, a package of raw hamburgers set up and on the front seat, half of which was gone, but nothing else was out of place. She was just never found. Just another disappearance on the reservation. Another common occurrence of Route 66 are UFO sightings and accompanying loss of time. There have been unexplained lights high in the sky that are either stationary or move too fast to be an airplane or helicopter. One story found a couple on their way home to Arizona from visiting family in Colorado. The lights appeared out of nowhere on a lonely, desolate stretch of Route 666. The husband was the first to notice. It stopped for fuel in Shiprock and it switched drivers because he was starting to get a headache. In the 1980s, 
Route 666 was just two lanes and treacherous. There were a lot of places to pass slower traffic, but it came at a risk of not seeing oncoming traffic that didn't have their headlights on, or even speeders not paying attention. Then there were the drunk drivers that caused a lot of accidents. White crosses dot both north and southbound where people have been killed by accidents on this highway. But on this night, this couple would see something that would change their lives forever. The lights came on one by one, and at first, the husband thought he was seeing stars. It's so dark out on this road, the stars are very bright and very visible. What is that? He recalled asking his wife as they cruised along. What? She replied. Those lights. Up there, he pointed toward the sky. I don't see anything, she said, half annoyed that he wanted her to take her eyes off the road to look. Pull over, he demanded. Why, she exclaimed. I'm tired and want to get home. She was clearly annoyed this time. They still had several hours of driving to do before their first stop on the way back to Tucson. Just pull over. He was getting annoyed too now. So she put her turn signal on and started to veer right. As the car came to the stop, he was already opening the door and getting out. Oh my God, come and look at this, Margaret. She rolled her eyes and opened the door. The warm desert air hit her as she stepped out of the air-conditioned car. Air conditioning was a luxury back then, and a welcomed one in this climate, because even at night, the desert can be hot. What? What? What are you looking at, George? More annoyed than ever. These, he said as he pointed up. Where? She trailed off as she caught sight of them. Whoa, what are they? She was mesmerized with the lights, and they seemed to change colors from shades of blue and pink to green to shades she'd never seen before. How is that even possible? She inquired. I don't know, but we better go. I don't have a good feeling about this, George said as he walked back to the car and got in. But his wife still stood there in a trance, swaying, almost pulsating with the light beams that were now drawing closer to them. Margaret, get in the damn car. She seemed to snap out of it, just long enough to turn and make eye contact with her husband right before she fainted. Shit, George exclaimed as he opened the door and went to get out, but realized he was still buckled in. Before he could get his seatbelt off and out of the car, Margaret was already up and running into the desert. Damn it, George yelled. Damn it. Margaret, stop! George called after, but she was gone in a shot. George returned to the car briefly to get a flashlight and grab the keys. He followed her shoe prints up to Boulder Field, where they stopped. Forgetting all about the lights at this point, he was worried about his wife. This was a time before cell phones, and there were no towns around for another hour at least. George didn't know what to do. He didn't want to just leave his wife out here, but he needed to go for help. After two hours of looking, and unsuccessfully so, he decided to leave in favor of getting help. On the way to the car, he pondered what he would say to the police. Hi, my name is George, and I saw a UFO and demanded my wife pull over where she passed out, and then the crazy woman went tearing off into the desert. No, he couldn't tell the whole truth. It sounded ridiculous. He didn't even know what he saw. Back at the car, he paused and looked out into the desert once more. Where could she have gone, he asked himself aloud. I was right on her heels. He climbed behind the wheel and pulled onto the road, south towards Gallup, New Mexico. He'd been on the road for about a half hour when a flash of color coming up on his left caught his eye. It was his wife, Margaret. She was walking down the middle of the road. George pulled up beside her and stopped. She didn't even seem to notice. She just kept walking, even after he shouted her name. He ran up to her and spun her around, and the look on her face scared him more than anything he had ever seen. She wasn't there. She was there physically. But the Margaret he loved and married, had children with, and the only woman he had ever loved, was literally gone inside. The lights were on, but nobody was home. He ushered her to the car and buckled her in, made his way to Gallup and turned towards Arizona. Driving straight through, he made it to their home by the next evening. Margaret had slept the whole way. He put the car in park, glanced over to still sleeping Margaret, and shut the car off. George felt awful. It was all his fault. He had been the one that insisted she pull the car over and wouldn't listen when she initially said no. He unlocked the door to their home and returned to the car to retrieve his wife. She was awake now and asking if they were in Colorado. No, honey, he replied. We're home. Margaret began to cry. Huge tears streamed down her face. Don't make me go back there, she begged. Where, he asked. 
with those people, Margaret stammered. They hurt me, and they talked to me with their minds. It hurt, George. It hurt. Well, you don't have to go back. You're going to stay right here with me where you're safe and loved. George felt worse than ever. He took her inside and laid her down on their bed. The answering machine blinked with several messages. Family, no doubt, George thought to himself. Probably worried that they didn't call them this morning. He was just too exhausted to return calls right now. He'd take care of it tomorrow. He laid down next to Margaret, holding her soft hand, and quickly fell asleep. Ugh, I need Tylenol, George thought to himself as he rolled out of bed the next morning. He could have sworn he heard knocking, but laid there for a few minutes and heard nothing else. Tap, tap, tap. There it was again. It was knocking. Then he heard, Tucson Police Department. Anyone home? George made haste to the door and was met with two young officers, one looking in their car and one at the door. Uh, can I help you, officer? Yeah, we received a wellness check call for George and Margaret Reed. Are you George? Yes, but I don't understand why you're here. We got home last night, a day earlier than we'd planned. We were both tired, George went on to explain. So we came in and laid down. I fell asleep. Is Ms. Reed here? The officer asked. Yes, replied George. May we see her? Of course, George led the officer to the bedroom where Margaret was still sleeping. Ms. Reed? The officer shook her. Margaret opened her eyes and rolled over. Yes. Are you okay? Yes. Okay. The officer stepped back, glanced at George, and looking skeptical but satisfied that they were okay, started for the door. Oh, you guys might want to call your daughter. She's the one that called us for a wellness check. She said she hadn't heard from y'all in five days. Five days, thought George. Um, okay, officer, thank you. Now, the Reeds did a few interviews and wrote a book about the story and experience under a different name. Then they fell back into obscurity and asked for their privacy. This was six months after their first interview. Now, we've heard about skinwalkers and UFOs, but Highway 666 also said to be haunted by ghosts. One of those includes a ghost girl that appears wearing a flowing white gown. She just stands there beside the road looking for a ride. Once a car stops to let her in, she disappears, similar to the hitchhiking ghost story heard throughout the country and throughout the world. A man named Trevor had the following account. Here's what he says. I was traveling to Sheep Springs on Highway 666 in 2001 to pick up a broken down truck. It was about 2.30 a.m., and I was really tired, but the only tow truck driver on rotation that night for the company. I just passed through Newcomb and was about 20 minutes away from my destination. My eyes were getting so heavy, and the coffee just wasn't working. The desert air was cold, so I cracked my window to let some fresh air in the cab of the truck, hoping that that would help wake me up. I glanced down to the window crank for a second, and as I looked back up, there was a woman right there on the side of the road. At first, I didn't even notice what she was wearing, which, had I, I would have probably just kept driving. I took my foot off the accelerator and started to pull to the side, hitting my hazard lights. It was then that I watched her glide. She was gliding. The lights of my truck illuminating her pale form. Not walking, gliding. Her gown flowed in the cool breeze and her hair was whipping about in the wind, but it was all wrong. It was like she had a wind force all her own causing the gown and hair to blow the wrong direction. For a moment, I was happy that I would have some company to keep me awake. But the closer she got to the door, the more anxious I got about her being there. I had readily ignored some very important facts about this situation. Like, why was she in a gown? Why was she out here in the middle of the night? And where was her stuff? She had no personal effects. Zero. None. No purse. No pack. No jacket. For a split second, I thought she might be the owner of the truck that I'd been called to pick up. But remember the call came in as a man needing a tow because of an oil leak. This certainly wasn't a man. She made it to the door and started to climb up. I leaned over the seat to pop the door open because it was locked. But as soon as my hand touched the door handle and I looked up to greet her and what I saw was forever burned into my memory. Her face was pale white. Everything was in the right place except I could see right through her. I blinked hard, shook my head, trying to clear the vision. She was just standing there, staring at me with what should have been eyes but were just black holes. Let me in, she said in a seductive but stern voice. 
And for a second, I wanted to. Now, I'm not a holy man, but in this instance, all I could think to do was pray. I closed my eyes and started to recite the only prayer I could remember. Now I lay me down to sleep. I knew how ridiculous it sounded, but I needed to feel like I wasn't alone. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. I finished. Peeked out the window, and she was gone. I sat up quickly, looking at the sage swaying in the wind and my flashing lights reflecting on the ground. I checked all my mirrors and saw nothing. I turned my emergency hazard lights off, put my turn signal on, slipped my truck into gear, and got the hell out of there. I was jumpy the rest of the night. I got to the truck I was towing, and the whole time I was loading it, my head was on a swivel. I had the feeling I was being watched, but there was no one around. Not one car even passed by while I was there loading that truck up. I finished my work and got back into my tow truck, still feeling like she was going to jump out of the brush at me any second. I even checked my truck before I got back in, and thank goodness the cab was empty. On my way back, I took a different route. I didn't have to pass by where I saw her. Honestly, I don't know if I had the willpower to not stop again. It felt like she was luring me, beckoning me to open the door. Her voice was as smooth as satin, and again, I wanted to let her in. The trip back was uneventful, and for that I am grateful. To this day, I cannot pass by that spot on Route 666 without seeing her standing there, that gown flowing around her, waving to me, calling to me, let me in. Now, in addition to the spooky stuff, now, in addition to all that, if that weren't enough, there's a lot of missing and murdered indigenous stories that come off the Navajo Reservation that Route 666, now 491, travels through. A lot. You've heard some of them here on this channel with their Spirited Away series. The following story was told by a father relocating his family to Durango, Colorado. Here's what he has to say. I'd purchased an old U-Haul from a dealer in Gallup, New Mexico, to move my family from there to Durango, Colorado. We left Friday morning and expected to be in Durango around noon Saturday. The trip was pretty uneventful till about 20 miles outside of Shiprock. My daughter that was riding with me began to feel sick to her stomach and needed me to pull over. I pulled off the road to let her do her business. She was 12, so I didn't worry too much about letting her out of her own to have some privacy. After some 10 minutes or so, my daughter hadn't returned. Concerned she was sicker than I initially thought, my wife sent me to go look for her. I got out of the truck to go check on her, walking in the direction that I saw her going, calling her name the whole time. I began to feel concerned, though, when she didn't respond, until I quickened my pace and felt a pall of dread descend over me as I recalled all the stories I'd ever heard over the years about this devil's highway. I've never been one for superstition much and always thought those who told those stories were nervous Nellies or just straight-up liars. In a full-on panic now, though, I raced further down the road, screaming out my daughter's name. My terror couldn't have been more absolute when I heard the shrill, ear-splitting scream that only a 12-year-old girl could make come from a ravine just east of where I'd been heading. I suppose it was the adrenaline that kicked in and gave me strength to sprint those last 20 yards. I grabbed my daughter into my arms and raced back to my truck in what felt like mere seconds. Once we were back in the pseudo-safety of the van, I asked my daughter what happened. She said she ran off looking for a quiet place to throw up, and she wasn't sure which direction she'd gone or how far she'd traveled before she was overwhelmed by this need to throw up. She was forced to stop until the stomach cramp subsided. Just as she was getting ready to start back to the van, she saw a young Indian girl running towards her, not much older than herself, running towards her and calling out a woman. The girl said, Spirits cry, not for thee. Leave this place or die like me. This is when she said she screamed. I showed up, grabbed her, and ran off. I told my daughter and the rest of the family to lock the doors behind me. Keep them locked. I want to go look for this young native girl. My daughter, in what seemed to be a state of shock, shot out her hand on my arm, looked me in the eye, and said, Don't go, Daddy. It's too late. Feeling very frightened now by the look and demeanor of my daughter, I said, What do you mean it's too late? There's a little girl out there who needs our help, and I'm going to go find her. I'll never forget that feeling of spiritual vertigo and lament at the loss of my daughter's innocence as she calmly replied, Didn't you see her, Daddy? Didn't you see that she was holding her own head in her arms? 
I told you, Daddy. It's too late. Now, you don't have to believe my story. Hell, I wouldn't. But please do me this one favor. Take the 40 to the 20. Or take the 70 and come down from the north. But please, for the love of God, stay off Route 666. Now, these are just a few of the stories associated with the infamous Devil's Highway, Route 666. History has seen many changes to the area. The highway's five lanes now, and the road crews continue to make improvements. When the number of the highway was changed to 491, it seemed to take the negative air that surrounded the roadway with it, for the most part. Sightings of UFOs, ghostly girls, monsters, skinwalkers, hellish big rig trucks, and flaming children have slowed. But there's still plenty of history and stories, new and old, lore and tales, sightings and disappearances. The Devil's Highway will never escape its legendary mysterious past. This could simply be true due to the higher-than-normal accidents and fatalities that happened along this road. But if you do find yourself along 491, the former Highway 666, the Devil's Highway, be wary of the things that go speeding down the highway past you, or for people asking for a ride. It might just be the last time you're seen alive. Well, folks, there you have it. What do you think of these amazing stories of the Devil's Highway, Route 666? I look forward to your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. Till we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other, and be safe out there, in the forest, on the roads, wherever you are. Be aware of your surroundings. As for me, I'll see you a little farther on down the trail, but I won't see you on Route 666. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time. Tell your animals Steve says hi.